The spoken word is so powerful. For tens of thousands of years, our ancestors, homo sapiens, or, or humans, have gathered around fires and told their stories, their history, shared their culture. And still today, telling stories is, is still so popular in our own lives, sitting around our, our dinner tables or in our lounges or wherever we are, telling stories, communicating. It's part of our DNA. Today, we're going to start a journey about something that's directly impacted you, who you are, who we are as a species, our very essence, your very essence is because of this animal. I could sit here and I give you argument after argument on why this animal is so important to you and to us as a species. This medium we call podcasting is only possible because of this animal. Uh, for thousands of years, this animal has lived and died next to us. It changed the very trajectory of, of our own history as a species, and we haven't looked back. In fact, I could even argue we would have never landed on the moon, at least in 1969, if it was not for this animal. And all of these other advancements in technologies and, and quality of life that we enjoy today is because of them. So this is their story, and it starts now. And Secretariat being led, he is numbering... The horse. And the horse is the best thing in the world, isn't it? So I suppose one's always, I've always loved them, really. Ever since I was a little girl. Everybody's in line, and they're off. The secretary the way very well has good position. The love. Oh, I never thought owning a horse could mean so much to me. The madness. What kind of a horse is that? I've never seen a horse like that before. Lightning now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Their story. Mustang is more involved in the, in the early development of this breed than I thought they were, but they were. Welcome to Mad About Horses. We're going to go through a little thought experiment. And I'd like you to imagine all of the species of animals that have been by human side. Which ones have impacted us in our own evolution? You know, which animals have shaped us? Who we are? Some species have provided us with food. Others have provided us with transportation. And there's so many other factors that, that animals have impacted us. Now, with all those animals in your mind, try to imagine the one that comes to the top. Which one altered human history more than any other? Did you pick one? Well, I'm going to argue, because we are the products of our own ecosystem, no animal, not one, has a greater impact on human development than the horse. Just think about this, and, and, and this is what I love about podcasting, because it really can force you to use different parts of your brain as you're either driving or as you're laying down listening to this or as you're working in your garden or in your kitchen or wherever you are, even riding your horse. Uh, it makes you use and engage as parts of your brains that you're like, okay, you know, especially your imagination. So somewhere at some point in our history, there was the very first human who took a risk and jumped on a horse's back for the very first time. And when I personally think about that, I go back to my own first experience as a young child getting on the back of a, what we call a bomb-proof horse, one that, that, one that was, was not going to get spooked easily, and, and get on the back. And I remember the, the exhilaration of that, of feeling that animal under me. But imagine the first human to do that with a, with a less tame wild equid. You know, Equus ferus, that's the species name. And we'll get to talking about that. But that just, it, it just blows my mind. Whoever jumped on that, and we're going to have a whole podcast dedicated to talking about domestication and where this first happened or where they think it first happened. But it takes me back to my own first experience. So think about your own first time if you've ridden horses. And if you haven't, 
prepare yourself because it is an experience like none other. So go back to this early human. What was it like? How did it feel? How long did they hang on? So where did it happen? Why did they do it? Yet, once they took that first leap of faith, you know, uh, and then passed that knowledge on to subsequent generations, like we talk about the spoken word being so important. So, tr- you know, they, they weren't writing this down back then. They were telling these stories or, or showing people how to do it. For subsequent generations, life was never the same for humanity. And horses have been so pivotal in our own culture. Now, I want to put in donkeys too, because they're just as important. In in certain parts of the world, donkeys have made such an impact and and we're not ignoring them. And and they are part of this discussion. So when I do say horses, think donkeys too, because they're very important. But we've had a love affair with horses for tens of thousands of years. Some of the earliest cave paintings we find are of horses and they date back 30,000 years ago. And it was just over 6,000 years ago when that first person decided to ride a horse. And as part of this, you listening today, anybody that that works with horses, you are part of the story. Where are horses going to be in 10, 20, 30,000 years from now? They're still going to be next to us. They're still going to be a part of our lives. So just think about it. Every time you bring a new horse into your own family or you care for a horse, you're continuing this long tradition of caring and being a companion to these animals. Now, getting back to the original question, this is going to be kind of kind of fun to, to, to talk about a little bit. Which animal or animals has impacted human history the most? And so I'm just going to kind of give you just a brief glimpse into some of the other species and how they've affected us uh, in very ma- many positive ways. But then we'll contrast that with some of the things that the horse has done for us. And one of the very first animals we domesticated, I'm, I'm saving dogs for the last, but I- I'm going to start with with like food and fiber. When we domesticated sheep, that altered human history too, in, 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 in certain ways. I still argue horses were more, but sheep, in fact, were an important process of changing humanity. So about 10,500 years ago in Western Asia, so what they call the cradle of civilization, sheep were, were domesticated and they gave obviously food, uh, but also fiber, wool. So we were able to make clothes that were warmer and uh, you know, able to withstand the elements, things like that. But what it did too is we went from this hunter gatherer society where, you know, we, we lived in, in that cave so much, I'm sure, but also, you know, tents, teepees, the yurts used, uh, like the Mongolians, but a hunter gatherer society where you would follow herds of animals, pick berries, pick nuts. So you can imagine our diets weren't quite as good. I mean, humans weren't living very long lives back then like we are today. But when we domesticated sheep, you know, that gave us uh, an opportunity to settle and to build communities, small villages that eventually turned into the cities we see today, right? So so that was sheep were part of that. It wasn't the, they didn't sheep didn't change the whole world and I love sheep and uh, where I'm living in New Zealand, we have plenty of them, but you know, the, it was an important piece. Now to contrast that, the horse, when we were able to domesticate the horse a few thousand years later, it changed everything. It changed geopolitics. It changed boundaries for us where, you know, you could travel by, by foot so far each day. Now with a horse, you could go so much further. So what that allowed to do is settlements started to be able to trade so they could go to another settlement quicker and faster and and trade goods, trade stories like this. They could also trade genetics, marry into different families, and it changed borders. And it 
it changed the world. And one of the things I don't like to talk about a lot, but is warfare and, and the societies that could domesticate and saddle and, and the, the inventions of, of bridles and the inventions of stirrups. And, and, and we'll get into that, into the history of the horse a little bit later in a different podcast, but it changed everything. It changed my, my history, your history, your family's history that it rippled through time because of the horse. So it's, it's interesting when you start to think about it. Now let's look at another species or a couple other species that go into that livestock and, and pigs and cattle. Sheep were first, then about 9,000 years ago, same parts of Western Asia for pigs, but then cattle, interestingly enough, were first domesticated thought in the Eastern Sahara, so in, in Africa. But here, again, our diets were able to change. We, we were e able to have a more sustainable source of meat and milk. Uh, cattle gave us leather uh, to make things. Then also, uh, again, we were able to not hunt as much. So if you could imagine the hunter-gatherer society going out and hunting large megafauna was dangerous and, and people got injured that could lead to death, things like that. So once we were able to start domesticating these animals, especially the livestock animals, it did change human history and, and, and agriculture. I'm not bringing in the plants and, and all the other things that we domesticated around that time or grew crops, things like that, that, that also plays a key role in this story. But as far as animal protein, that changed everything back then. So with food sources, it, it, when it does come to, to, to pigs and cattle, not all cultures use them as food animals. I do want to recognize that. And, and horses were an important part early on of a food animal, and they are eaten in some cultures today. So want to be sensitive to that. But other things that cattle could do, like oxen, to contrast it with horses, oxen can can plow fields. Oxen can take carts over vast difference distances. But again, I could still argue the horse does that so much better. It's so much more of an athlete. And, you know, you, thinking of oxen, yes, they've played a, a big role in, in, in doing certain things, but nowhere close to the horse. I just, I could argue that day in, day out with anybody it's just the the physiology of the horse makes them more suitable for ta certain tasks. Their behavior in many instances make them better, even safer. You know, you could see about some oxen, they're, you know, maybe a little more clumsy and bigger and stronger. So, you know, they could hurt you a lot easier. I could just argue all day that horses were, were just superior in, in moving carts and, and helping doing some of the things that they did. Now, I'm going to throw in a, a fun one in here because I, I, I think some of the listeners, or maybe many of you, uh, have owned chickens, have worked with chickens. They're, they're, they're so fun, especially you know if you, if you have them to produce eggs and their behavior is a lot of fun. So I, I don't want to, I would be remiss not to mention them because they definitely have shaped our history and they often get overlooked. We don't think about chickens being domesticated, but they were. It was about 8,000 years ago in Asia. And even today in Asia, roosters are seen as good luck. They, they've played a big role in our history, not only as, as producing eggs, but also meat, uh, feathers, you know, for pillows and things like that. So, so they've been an important part of our story and have impacted us. And when you think about all of these animals and how they've revolutionized food production, not only did it help us be healthier, but we lived longer develop these communities. So this is when you start to see human population growth, when then it eventually leads to urbanization and, 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 get, you know, getting us to the moon, uh, getting us uh, into space, exploring other worlds. It, it, these animals all have played a key role in that. I still think the horse is the more important, but chickens, they, I could argue chickens were important part of that process. Uh, one of the things they've done is Chickens have played roles in, in research. You know, Mendelian genetics was Mendel was was using chickens and feather color, and, and that gave us an understanding or an early understanding of genetics. Where today, 
you're going to see in your lifetime and we're already seeing it now where like gene therapy is 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 on the horizon and medicine is is changing for the better so you know chickens have been important but again horses just as much if not more and in the next episode we're going to talk about evolution because i i really believe telling their story because the horses can't tell us they do tell us actually what through their bones and in the soil but you know they can't speak their story like like this but i'm going to explain why the horses are are just the best representation we have in the fossil record of any animal to show evolution as they go from a four-toed, three-toed, single-toed animal, their teeth change. We, we just, we have so much evidence for it. It's such a fascinating story. So that's coming up. But horses, as far as research, one of the things I love about them, and I've talked many years about is and maybe maybe some of you aren't aware of it is is horses used in in disability programs for riding and it, just going to research so chickens with research horses with research one of the things i love is all the research coming out where horses are helping people with disabilities whether it's learning disabilities physical disabilities rehabilitation because anybody that rides horses knows you use a different set of muscles it trains a different set of muscles and the research has shown that if certain people with, with physical disabilities ride horses, it strengthens certain sets of muscles and they have a better quality of life, emotional better quality of life, all of these things. And even my own research that I've done back in the day in academia, you know, I've used horses as a model to help endangered species. So horses are just, uh, just fascinating. They can hold their own against any other species when it comes to research. Now, some of the bigger ones, because I'm going to get to, I, I, I want to lead you to where horses are, without a doubt, human's best friend. Period. End of story. Close the book. That's the end of the chapter. That's it. But we'll get there in a second. Uh, last two species I want to talk about that, that probably impact you, definitely have impacted me, and that's our cats and then our dogs. And cats, I find fascinating as far as their domestication. They were domesticated around Egypt, and scientists think they domesticated themselves, meaning they just were hanging around people thinking, oh, you guys are kind of cool. Well, you're feeding me a little bit. Okay, I'll hang out with you. And that's just, to this day, cats are still that way, where it's like, mm, I'll let you pet me. Nah, don't touch me. But it's just funny when you talk about them. And some of the benefits of, of cats around back in the day was they were very good at controlling rodents. So. You can imagine they had big grain silos protecting their food. Cats were important uh, for us. It benefited us for reducing rodent populations. Rodents have spread many diseases around the world. So uh, cats have played a, a key role there and, and we love them. You know, it's good companionship when you, if you've owned cats and, and then going to the big one, our canids, our dogs, we're not quite sure when they were domesticated as late as 30,000 years ago, some think up to 15,000 years ago, often called human's best friend. They are wolves. You know, look at your dog. They, they are domesticated wolves. And again, we'll talk about domestication in a few podcasts, that whole process, but they have undoubtedly changed our lives. They are loyal. We love them. I love mine. Uh, all the dogs in my life that I've had and held and, and just loved since I was a little boy, they definitely have improved my life. Uh, research studies have shown pet ownership, you know, improves our mental well-being. They offered us a, a lot of protection side by side humans for, for tens of thousands of years. I get it. They're definitely number two on humans best friend list. But you, you just cannot argue away how the horse has played such a key and pivotal role in human evolution. As we go in this podcast, one of the things I like to do is, is, read, is, is go into the literature, read research. That's what I've, my training is. I'll, I'll talk about myself uh, later in this podcast. 
I just give you an idea who I am. Uh, I found this study the other day. It was ancient DNA shows domestic horses were introduced in the Southern Caucasus and Anatolia during the Bronze Age. And just the first part, I think, captures what I'm trying to say about the horse. And so I thought it was worth reading uh, and quoting this study. This was in Science Advances in 2020. Just to quote them real quick. The domestication of the horse roughly 5,500 years ago represents one of the most important technological innovations in the ancient world. With the harnessing of horsepower, political, economic, and social relationships throughout the ancient world were transformed as horses revolutionized transportation and affected patterns of trade, warfare, and migration. There you go. It's just one of the most important technological innovations. So we think of the airplane, automobile, DNA sequencing, all these things that we have in the modern world as being important. Maybe, okay, I could, I could see where airplanes might, might argue against horses, but we wouldn't have been able to fly if it wasn't for the horse. There's no other animal that has impacted us like that, that, that has changed us. So I'm, I'm beating the point into the ground. No other animal has stood side by side us. Next to the dogs, yes, but we rode horses. We've died with horses. They've bled with us across countless battlefields, through migration, crossing the oceans. Horses have changed everything. And again, not to forget about the donkeys. They've had similar impacts around the world. Not quite as much as the horse, but they are next to them. They've played key roles in many parts of the world, and, and, and we're going to talk about donkeys, too, in this podcast. As I end this, to, to finish out this thought experiment, imagine a world without horses. Imagine a world without donkeys, zebras, none of them. Say they went extinct 10 million years ago, 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, whatever it was, before we domesticated them. They're not there. Is there any other species on earth that can do what they do? You could maybe argue camels, but they're really located to certain regions and habitats. They, they, they can't survive in some of these other, other areas of the earth. Can't quite do what horses do. We talked about cattle. Can't quite do what horses do. Can't ride them lo as long distances, things like that. Elephants, maybe, but they're massive. I mean, they, they've been tamed and not domesticated, like especially the Asian elephants. African elephants have been tamed and used in warfare, things like that. Those uh, being around elephants, doing elephant research, they're not easy to manage. They're not cheap to feed. It's You got to hold them. They're, don't, no. There's just no other species on earth that could ever replace the hoof prints of our horses. Thus, this podcast is dedicated to the many millions and millions and millions of horses that have lived and died next to their human handlers. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Chris Mortensen. I'm the director of education for Mad Barn, and I'm, and I'm so proud to be the host of Mad About Horses. Each week, I'm going to be bringing you a new chronicle and the epic story of the horse and, and just their profound impact on our lives and then also the impact that you have on their lives. It's, 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 a, it's a back and forth relationship. And again, this podcast is just all about the horse. But before we dive in, I just want to give you some background on who I am and why I've been trusted to tell this important story. Uh, you know, I grew up with a love for animals since I was a little boy, but horses just captured me at a young age, uh, watching my father work with them and then going off into college and the university system. I just, I, it just, this was my animal. This was the animal I was going to study and know everything about. So it did guide my entire career. I went and got my master's degree at Fresno State, and I was doing a bunch of research in horse nutrition, physiology, went off and got my PhD from te Texas A&M, where I really specialize in equine reproductive physiology and exercise physiology. 
And then I've been an educator for over a decade. I've had the privilege of teaching students, you know, thousands of them at the University of Florida and Clemson in face-to-face classes and online classes. I just, I love teaching. It's who I am. I'm an educator at heart. I, I, I love to share knowledge. And one of my highlights in my academic career was I, I was one of the, the early adapters of uh, these free college online courses. And I did one through Coursera called The Horse Course. And it was a, a massive success where I think in the first iteration, I had close to 60,000 students. Uh, then we have, you know, 20, 30,000 students. And today there's over 50,000 students enrolled in the last few years. And they were all from 164 different countries. It was just an experience that it just showed me how powerful education is and, and how we can reach so many uh, in so many different cultures and, and cities around the world. So it just, it opened my eyes that education should be open and accessible to everyone. And that is why, you know, I jumped into podcasting. And just like in the classroom, I give everything I have. I'm, I'm, I'm spending the hours doing the research, making sure the information I, I, I give you is, is accurate, up to date, and correct. It was also one of the reasons I, I started an, another podcast a few years ago with my good friend, uh, Dr. Angie Adkin. She's actually my best friend. Her families are very close. Uh, we started this All Creatures podcast, and it was all about all animals, uh, endangered species, talking to conservation experts. It introduced me to the world of podcasting, how powerful it could be and, and how many people it could reach. And we had such an amazing response to the All Creatures. I mean, we've been nominated twice as a top, top 10 science podcast in the world. Recently, just this past year, we were nominated as a top 10 education podcast. So if you love animals, you can check that out. Or if you're here, it's probably because I told you on All Creatures that uh, I had a new podcast out there, Mad About Horses. Now, This podcast isn't about me, it's about the horses, it's about you, and each week we're going to cover topics that focus specifically on understanding horses better so we can give them the best possible lives and and make the most of our time with them while they're with us. When I've worked with people as an educator, I've always been, if I can improve your horse's life, it will make your life better. You know, and save some money in the end, but it's more about improving their lives, which in turn is going to improve your lives. So that's always been my philosophy. Now, we're going to cover a wide range of topics in this podcast. So if you're a novice or a professional, my hope's that you're going to learn something. And if there's any topics you want us to cover uh, specifically, uh, and, and I'll mention this after every episode, but we, we'd love to hear them. So you can reach out to me anytime at podcast at madbarn.com, or you can find Madbarn on Instagram or Facebook. You can also visit, visit us by searching Mad Barn online, and you'll find many articles and resources related to equine nutrition and health. We have an amazing team of over eight PhD scientists, five veterinarians, seven masters in science, nutritionists working. It's an incredible team that, that's supporting me, uh, making sure we can get this podcast out each week. And the company philosophy with Mad Barn, and, and, and it's what makes me so excited to be part of this initiative is we just fundamentally believe that education needs to be out there for any horse owner or anybody interested in horses you know they should be able to have access to this information it doesn't need to be gatekeeped or or people paying for it so we believe in in providing that so i'm excited that you've decided to join me in this podcast and i just want to thank you for listening to mad about horses and we're going to go on an incredible journey to learn more about our horses our connection to them and how we can make the world a better place for every horse.